media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Nadine Wellwood. She's running for the People's Party of Canada in the riding of Banff Airdrie in Alberta. Her website, NadineWellwood.ca. Nadine, welcome to the Goddard Report. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. Nadine, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, I'm uh, 49 years old, a mother of one, and I uh, lived in Alberta here for 16 years uh, in Cochrane, and a uh, chartered investment manager. I've owned an aerospace and defense company. Um, you know, I have an alternative health diploma that I did for my own personal benefit, and uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, <laughs> what more would you like to know? <laughs> well, Banff Airdrie is your writing. Derek Sloan was parachuted into it. Uh, who is Derek Sloan, and can you tell us about your writing? Well, Banff uh, Airdrie is a very large riding um, federally. We basically go all the way up to the B.C. border and uh, to the eastern side of Airdrie and Crossfield with a lot of small communities, including Batrell and uh, Crossfield, um, it's, it's a very large riding. It's, it's mostly a rural riding, but obviously Airdrie being the largest sort of city within it. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, we, we have the foothills of the Rockies, we have a national park, and we have a city. So it's very diverse in its voter base and uh, very diverse in its geography. But uh, it's been home for me for, like I said, 16 years. And, yeah, Derek Sloan decided he was going to parachute in, um, committed to stay for 33 days and rescue Albertans in Alberta, and uh, asked me to uh, step aside. So who is Derek so Sloan, well. and and, uh, and what's the deal here with him? Um, well, Derek Sloan, I mean, is, is a conservative MP who um, has a riding in Ontario, Hastings, Lennox, Addington, where his wife, is now running um, you know how's that for a commitment to Albertans but um, you know I, I haven't really given him a whole lot of press or, or paid too much attention to him since uh, my original uh, response to his decision to stay and, and run in this riding but um, you know it was very selfish I think it was uh, a little bit arrogant He's decided that he wants to take on Blake Richards. He has his own personal vendetta. And, you know, I think he's just dragging Albertans into the middle of uh, his own personal issues um, with, with Blake Richards, which is not fair to Albertans. Yeah, I know Albertans like Albertans, and uh, I know they certainly have an attitude towards people from Ontario who think they know everything. Is that the kind of feeling you're getting from the people you talk to? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think Derek Sloan will gather some of the vote here um, because his message sounds wonderful, and it should because it's the People's Party of Canada message. Um, he he contacted Maxime when he wanted to run as the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada and said, hey, you know, can I run on your platform? And Max was like, you know, go right ahead. Um, you know, it, it is the People's Party of Canada message, which is why it's so appealing to people. But, yeah, you don't parachute in as an Ontarian um, to an Alberta riding. Albertans, we, we've we've had enough of that. We, we had that with Jason Kenney even. You know, oh, here's the Ontario politician who's going to save us. And uh, that hasn't worked out so well, and, and that's still fresh in the minds of a lot of Albertans. Why do you think Sloan didn't join the People's Party? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it would have given him the strongest platform and the best opportunity to actually share the message. Um, he, he really should have joined if that was indeed his case. Well, one of the interesting things I've been telling people is if this was about the message and not about Derek Sloan, um, you know, 
Max had said, hey, come sit down with us. Let's find where you fit within the party, whether that's a deputy leader position or whatever it is. He was a sitting member of parliament. Max would actually be in the debate today had Derek Sloan made this about the message and not himself, because as a sitting member, um, we would have had Max as the leader of the party in the debate. So there's all sorts of interesting things that you can, you know, look at there. And, and again, just draw back to the fact that this is about him. Um, it's, it's not about the message, and it's not about anything other than a personal vendetta that he has with, uh, with Blake Richards. I think I've already asked you, but uh, how are people in Airdrie Banff uh, receiving Derek Sloan's candidacy? Um, you know, so let, let's take the Cochrane Labor Day parade that we just did on Monday. We uh, apparently people from the crowd have told me that, you know, the the response to, to Blake Richards, the Conservative Party of Canada, for example, was very sullen. <laughs> not a lot of hand waving, not a lot of hoots and hollers. Derek Sloan, you know, had a handful of people waving, cheering him on. And apparently, you know, the People's Party of Canada, and we saw that even on the CBC and the um, the national news, you know, get a lot of people, thumbs up, waving, cheering. Um, so I, I think Derek Sloan is going to be very sad when the, the election is over on the 20th because Albertans will stand and support strong Albertans. And we have it covered. He should have stayed in Ontario and uh, fought for his constituents there, not abandoned them. Um, you know, that this message needs to be spoken all across Canada right now. And Alberta had it covered. We know what the sting of, you know, not getting a fair deal and, you know, having our rights and our freedoms trampled on. But uh, we need to share that message across the, the, the country. And had he stayed in Ontario, I think would have been the right thing for him to do. Why do you think Trudeau called an early election? Because it's all about Trudeau. Um, th- this was nothing more than his attempt to grab a majority. And I always tell people, you have to wonder, when Trudeau calls an election, when he has basically gotten everything he has asked for with zero opposition, Why would he do that? Because I think he understands, now maybe not he himself, I don't give him enough credit uh, intellectually to fully understand, um, you know, the the inner workings of government and economy, but the people who are pushing him and, and pulling his strings from behind the scenes certainly do. And I think there's a lot of economic turmoil in particular that's coming, we've and, and I think that's why he's trying to get ahead of that wave, and he wanted a majority to push through his agenda um, before some of the real problems that we're seeing economically as created by the government and these lockdowns. Um, he wanted to get ahead of that wave. Have all the mainstream parties banded together against the People's Party? Um, they're all the same. The Conservative Party of Canada, Trudeau, thing, whether it's uh, climate lockdowns now, which is the new new thing, everybody agrees there's going to be climate lockdowns, vaccine passports, um, Trudeau, uh, O'Toole, thing, gun legislation, carbon tax, co- climate plan, Paris Accord, they're all identical. The, the People's Party of Canada is the only option for anybody who wants something different. Some people are set in their ways, always voting for the same party. How do you reach those people with the PPC message? Um, I think people are reaching them from the bottom up. Uh, families, friends, they're coming together and they're realizing themselves that there is no difference anymore between the Conservative Party of Canada, the Liberal Party, and the NDP. All of them are singing from the same sheet of music. And I, I'm one of the things I've been telling people to say, I've voted conservative all my life. And I'm going, yeah, but how, A, how has that served us? You know, we're in the same mess today, actually worse than we were four, or two years ago, even when we had the last election. But more importantly, just tell me one, just give me one major policy issue where Aaron O'Toole is different. And I just get blank stares, which for me, they answer their own question. Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, the Great Reset, where you get to own nothing and be happy about it. 
Former Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney signed Canada onto Agenda 21. Former Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper signed Canada onto Agenda 2030. Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, along with other world leaders, have been implementing these agendas. Could these agendas and the extreme debt loads taken on by consumers and homeowners, along with the Trudeau government's out-of-control spending spree, be designed to bankrupt Canada and the people of Canada in time for 2030? Well, I don't know if it was designed to do so, but if you consider the fact that these lockdowns have destroyed the private sector and the small business sector, which is the heartbeat of the Canadian economy, um, that's a sure way to, to bankrupt a, a country. And, you know, we're seeing, um, as a result, you know, massive unemployment and a dependency upon government, which absolutely I think would fit into, um, you know, an agenda. Um, you know, if, if the goal is to bankrupt the country, the, the billions of dollars that they're spending in deficits, the lockdowns that they've done um, certainly are, are doing just that. They're bankrupting businesses. They're bankrupting individuals. Um, the only person who and entity that's really coming out here ahead is actually the government. Are Canadian companies and politicians signed on to Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum? Um, well, Justin Trudeau said it himself. You know, this COVID-19 is the opportunity they have been waiting for. So, I mean, that would imply that this is something that they've been discussing and working towards, and he did call it the Great Reset. Um, I personally made the took the time to read uh, Klaus Schwab's books, both of them, The Fourth Industrial Revolution and COVID-19, The Great Reset. And, um, you know, it certainly appears to me that that is indeed Justin Trudeau's plan. And if you consider that Aaron O'Toole and, and uh, Jagmeet Singh um, are in full agreement with climate plan, you know, Green New Deal, um, carbon taxes, now climate lockdowns, you know, vaccine passports. These are all very socialist policies, which are all very consistent with what the World Economic Forum um, has has proposed to put forward. Is China a friend of Canada? You know, I spent four months in China, and the Chinese people are so wonderful. They are so um, excited, usually, to see somebody from the West and, you know, value Western principles and uh, they are wonderful but the Chinese Communist Party is no friend of Canada and we've seen that with the you know arrest of our two Michaels and uh, the fact that they have yet to be released and it's become a, a political bargaining chip um, we're seeing what's happening in Taiwan and the attacks that are being made on freedoms and liberty. Um, they also are the largest benefactor to the United Nations so no. China is not, uh, and when I say China, I'm referring to the Chinese Communist Party. They are not a friend of Canada. What would need to be done to turn Canada into an economic powerhouse? You know, the, the best thing that could happen right now in Canada is for government to get out of the way and to allow private initiatives to step up to the plate. The free market is really the only way that we stand to actually weather this storm somewhat reasonably. And there's a lot of economic issues right now that unfortunately have been overshadowed by these vaccine passports and the rhetoric that, you know, the Liberal government has been going on with. Um, our global supply chain is a big one of that. Um, you know, we have right now a lack of staff. We have issues at our ports. We have um, shipping containers. We got ships that are not being able to get unloaded. Uh, there's so much happening that uh, you know is not. It, it's the undercurrent. It, it's just not getting the attention that it deserves. Are we seeing inflation or stagflation, and how could it affect the economy? Well, we're definitely seeing inflation. We've already seen 31 percent in food prices. And you have to see inflation because the government, so, so inflation is caused when government prints money. And the government is printing billions upon billions of dollars. They're running billions of dollars of deficits in order to fund their programs. And it's not, it's, it's not the money that we have. It's money that we're having to print, money that we're borrowing. And of course we're going to see inflation as a direct result of that. Are we likely to see continued product shortages? Well, this is where the global supply chain comes into place. 
Um, again, it's an issue that nobody is talking about, but it is a serious issue. And we have uh, shipping containers that we have ships that are, are sitting offshore that can't get into ports because the ports are full. We have staff shortages because it's now more lucrative to stay at home and collect a paycheck than it is to go to work. Um, we have a lack of truck drivers to distribute the goods and services. So are we going to see more product shortages? I believe here within the next, well, any time really, but within the next six months, probably to the next two years, we're going to see bare shelves on a number of different products. We'll have more with Nadine Wellwood right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Nadine Wellwood. Nadine, people are getting used to staying at home and getting paid by the government to do nothing. Is this a push towards totalitarian government? Well, every totalitarian government um, means that the people need to be reliant upon the government and not themselves. So creating a dependency is absolutely a push to a more authoritarian, totalitarian government. What are people doing with their investment dollars? Right now, I think people are at a loss as to where to put their money. And uh, as a chartered investment manager, you know, I think we've got some economic challenges coming. Um, you know, you've got your big thing, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, that's all doing very well. But it's being propped up again by government and manipulation. So I, I think... With global shortages and with things that we've got on the horizon, I think people should be cautious about being invested in the markets personally. Um, I think owning assets that are a hedge against inflation are not a bad thing. Um, you know, owning, making sure that you've got a good pantry of supplies uh, stocked up is not a bad thing either. So, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, without understanding an individual's goals and objectives, you know, it's, it's very broad-based and you can't give advice. But, um, you know, we, we've got inflation coming, and I think uh, any asset that is a hedge against inflation is probably a, a good investment to make right now. Your thoughts on mandatory vaccines and vaccine passports? You know, mandatory vaccines and passports have no place in Canada. Discrimination is discrimination. And discrimination based upon someone's medical choices is no different than someone's choice um, of sex, gender, religion, or, you know, sexual orientation. It has no place here. It's discrimination. So people have the right to make their own decisions, um, what they put into their own body. It is, is their decision between them and their doctor. It, it's to do what's right for them, to do what's right for their family. It's the government. The government has no say. It, it's none of their business. How long would legal challenges take to get our rights and freedoms back? <laughs> Too long. Um, I, you know, I did a great interview with a constitutional lawyer when we did the No More Lockdowns Rodeo here in Bowdoin, um, you know, back in the spring. And the reality is for things to work their way through the courts will take years. And I think we don't have that kind of time right now in on honesty. Um, this has to be a grassroots movement. People have to take to the streets. They have to call their MLAs, their MPs, their mayors, their town councillors. And um, that's the only way that um, I think any of this ends is when people at the ground level, grassroots, say, we're done, enough is enough. Why does the left like to control people through fear? Well, um, again, I, I, I've worked with aerospace and defense. I've owned a modeling and simulation human factors engineering company. Fear is a very strong emotion. Um, and if you're talking psychological warfare in particular, fear is, is, is far more effective than offering a reward, for example. It motivates people um, to do things far faster, and it also... Um, from a perspective of people thinking, you don't think 
clearly when you're in a state of panic or a state of fear. So I think it's, uh, it, it is a way to control the population. Thus, we're seeing, you know, one variant after the next variant, after the next variant. Oh, this one's worse. This one's this. They're just continually propagating the fear-mongering because they know if they stop at this stage, they will lose control. And that's what it's all about, is maintaining control. What percentage of people can think for themselves? Um, you know, everybody has the capacity and the capability to think to, for themselves, but I think a lot of people are very caught up today in just trying to survive. You know, they have to put food on the table. There's families working two, three jobs just to stay ahead of, you know, the cost of living. And um, But there was an interesting study done by Edward Bernay, uh, the father of Spin, and uh, one of the largest marketing companies in the world. And when he was commissioned by the Rothschilds to do a study about discernment, what he found was only 11% of the population used their own discernment to come to their own conclusions. Everybody else just followed along. Is this election about freedom versus tyranny? Uh, in my opinion, this certainly is an election about freedom versus tyranny. We have a government that has infringed upon the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of Canadians, um, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. They've completely violated um, the laws of this nation. And if we allow a government, you know, to just violate its own rules and its own laws because we're in a crisis, that's why these laws are there to begin with, because they are there to protect us in times like this, in times of crisis, to make sure that the government doesn't, you know, overreach its legitimate authority. So, yes, we are being challenged as Canadian citizens to either stand as free individuals who have rights and freedoms, and those rights and freedoms will be protected under our laws, or we're going to accept a government that will violate those laws at its own convenience, and that is tyranny. Does or should the Nuremberg Code apply to crimes committed against Canada and the people of Canada? And I'm thinking specifically of the code that says you shouldn't be forced to take part in a medical experiment without your express consent and permission. Um, The Nuremberg Code is very clear. And there's a few things that are being violated with the Nuremberg Code right now. So we are being coerced and manipulated. People are being told you can lose your job if you don't get vaccinated. That is a direct violation of the Nuremberg Code. The other one is incentives. We have um, politically here in this province of Alberta a premier who said, I'll pay you $100 to come and get a vaccine. Again, that is a direct violation of the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code was put into place after Nazi Germany because so many doctors, and and this is the thing, we had doctors and nurses that, you know, take an oath to uphold the health and the well-being to put their patients first, conducting experiments on human beings. This is why the Nuremberg Code exists. And here we're seeing a repeat of it all over again today. Do you see a path ahead where Maxime Bernier could be prime minister later this month? You know, Justin Trudeau won the last election with 6 million votes. Right now, apparently, if you do the math, there are 6 to 7 million Canadians who refuse or do not or are unable to get vaccinated. So if everybody cast their ballot um, in favor of freedom, fairness, respect, and responsibility, I believe anything is possible. How can people follow you and find out more about your campaign? So you can follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Um, my website is nadinewellwood.ca, and of course it contains little links to take you to any of those uh, other sites. And uh, I've been pretty active and out and about. We are also going to be in Airdrie at the Public Library this evening. And we've got three debates uh, set up for next week, actually. The first one is in Canmore on Monday evening. And the second one is in Cochrane on Tuesday evening. And then we have the third one happening in Airdrie, hosted by the Airdrie Chamber of Commerce. 
uh, on the Thursday evening. So three um, great opportunities to hear what all the candidates have to say. And, of course, my website will take you to platform issues and uh, all my social media feeds. Now, uh, having just talked to uh, Maxine Bernier before this interview, it seems to me the People's Party is the only one advocating tax reductions. Everybody else is uh, talking about using taxes to punish certain people, certain positions, uh, certain philosophies, uh, economic activity, and so on. Why the big split here? Because he'd like to see your personal tax exemption go up. I haven't heard anybody else talk about it. What's your feeling on that? Well, if we're going to make things more affordable, I think the easiest way to do that is to get government out of the way. The government is the biggest expense to all Canadians. So by implementing a carbon tax, you're taking money out of the pocket of, of, you know, individual Canadians who are just trying to find ways to make ends meet. So you've just made fuel more expensive, heating costs more expensive, food more expensive, housing more expensive, um, we we need to to rein that in and spending billions of dollars of money we do not have really we are basically loading the next generation to have to pay for expenses that we are spending today and it, it's not fair on future generations but it causes inflation inflation is a direct result of government printing more money so we have to reduce the expense to average Canadians. Right now, they're they're overloaded with debt, most of it not through any fault of their own. It's actually government actions and these lockdowns um, and government spending that's causing these pricing increases. Nadine, thank you so much for being on the Goddard Report. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish you a great day. Good luck in the election. Thank you so much. Let's not leave it to luck. My guest has been Nadine Wellwood. She's running for the People's Party of Canada in the riding of Banff Airdrie in Alberta. Her website, nadinewellwood.ca. If you have any questions for Nadine or anybody else who's been on the Goddard Report, you can send them to info at howstreet.com, and we'll ask that question the next time we talk to that person. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.